Captain Le Chatelier. Me and my crew are taking over this video, and we're gonna take you to the Briny Deep, you scurvy land lovers. Where's my hat? What? Can't you see I'm trying to hijack this video here? What do you mean Mr. Wiggins cut your ear off? Well, I'll give you a dollar for it. Why? Because you're a buccaneer. <laughs> Bad pirate jokes. Okay, now that we got that taken care of, let's get down to business. Last time we talked about equilibrium, how the forward rate of a reaction can be equal to the reverse rate in a reversible reaction. Whew, that got me out of breath. Now we said that equilibrium is dynamic. It keeps moving. The forward rate still goes, the reverse rate still goes, but the transfer is the same. Same amount going forward will be the same amount going backward. It doesn't mean necessarily that we'll have the same amount of reactants and products, but that the rates, the respective rates, are the same. We also said that in a reversible reaction, every reversible reaction has a particular equilibrium constant for that reaction. And the way that we get that is that we take the ratio of the concentrations of the products over the concentrations of the reactants. Now remember, if in that equation we have some coefficients in front of our compounds, we use those coefficients as exponents. You got it? Good. All right. Now remember also, this is at a specific temperature. If we change the temperature, the K value will change as well. And this is for a closed system, which means there's no reactants coming in or out, and there's no products being added or taken away either. But what if we do? In 1888, a French scientist named Henri-Louis Le Chatelier was trying to make his reactions more productive. And in doing so, he stumbled upon something that he called Le Chatelier's principle. And that is, if a stress or a change is applied to a system at equilibrium, then that system is going to shift toward the direction to relieve that stress. So what does that mean for us today? Let's go back to the SS Le Chatelier. Let's say this view of the captain's boat on the open sea is a typical reversible reaction with the reactants on the left and products on the right. The ship will represent the way the system will move, the direction it will move to reestablish equilibrium after a stress has been placed on it. So let's say, for example, we add more reactants to this reaction. Well, in that case, the system is going to push toward the product side and make more products, just like the boat moving toward the product side. In the same way, if we take away some of the reactants, the system will move toward the reactant side, as if to fill the void that those reactants left when they were taken away, just like the boat would, as if it were being dragged toward a violent whirlpool. The last parties! It's every man for himself! In the same way, if we add more products to a reaction that's in equilibrium, that reaction will begin to make more reactants and will push to the left, just as the boat pushes to the left side of <clears throat> um, the ocean. This direction, I'm the post. The ship is off course. Hey, Captain, I'm doing the best I can. And likewise, if we remove products, then we'll see that reaction begin to make more products in order to fill the void left from removing them. Let's say we have this generic reaction, A plus B yields C plus D. It's a reversible reaction. If we add more A or add more B, what that means is the reaction is going to push forward and it's going to make more products as a result. If we take away some of the A or take away some of the B, that means the reaction is going to proceed back and fill that void. Same goes on the product side. If we add more C or add more D, the reaction is going to push off toward the reactant side, just like that wave pushed away, right? But then, if we pull out some C or pull out some D, 
that reaction is going to fill the void and go toward the product side, making more products in the process. Does it make sense? Here's an example using carbon monoxide, hydrogen, to form methane and water. You'll notice that when CO is added, that the reaction is stronger in the forward direction. You notice how I've made this arrow a little bigger in the forward direction? That's one way we can designate this, to show that the forward reaction is stronger. Meanwhile, the reverse reaction, not so strong. Why? Because we have to make more products to reduce the stress of putting more carbon monoxide in that system. But with this other reaction, we've removed some carbon monoxide, which means that now the reverse reaction will be stronger. It's got to fill the void, right? The wave has to fill that void, and so the reverse reaction is stronger, the forward reaction not so strong. We have to make more reactants to make up for the void and to reestablish equilibrium once again. The same can be said for products as well, of course. If we add water to this reaction, it's going to cause that wave to push toward the left, isn't it? Back toward the reactants. So when we add more products, this reaction has to make more reactants to make that equilibrium reestablish. So when we remove water, that forward reaction is stronger. The wave has to fill that void so that we can make more products to reestablish that equilibrium. But adding reactants or taking them away and adding products or taking them away isn't the only kind of stress we can put on a system. Let's look at some other ways as well. Let's look at temperature first. Now in this reaction, we have an exothermic situation, negative 206.5 kilojoules of enthalpy, exothermic. In other words, heat is a product of this, isn't it? So we can see that heat can be just like any other reactant or product. In this case, heat is a product, an exothermic reaction, and let's say we increase the temperature on that reaction. What will it do? It will push back toward the reactants. The reverse reaction will be stronger than the forward reaction. Why? Because we're adding product to that reaction. So, more reactants have to be made to compensate. Meanwhile, if we were to cool this reaction somehow, well, since heat is a product and we're cooling it, it's like taking that heat away, isn't it? We're removing the heat, removing a product, and that means that the forward reaction will now be stronger than the reverse reaction. We have to make more products to compensate. An endothermic reaction would be the reverse of that. The enthalpy of this reaction is positive 55.3 kilojoules and going from dinitrogen tetroxide to nitrogen dioxide. So what that means is that heat is a reactant in this situation. So how will heating and cooling this reaction affect equilibrium? So if we increase the temperature on this reaction, we are adding more reactant in essence, and that means the forward reaction will be stronger. We'll have to make more product to reestablish that equilibrium. But if we lower the temperature, it's like we're removing heat, aren't we? So because of that, the wave has to fill the void. The reverse reaction will be stronger. We've got to make more reactant to reestablish the equilibrium. Now let's go back to this reaction for a moment to illustrate what happens when we change the volume. What happens to the equilibrium situation then? Before we answer this question, let's do one thing. First, I want to show you that this left side, the reactant side, has four moles worth of particles, doesn't it? One mole of carbon monoxide, three moles of hydrogen. So we'll say four moles here. What about this side? One and one. So there's less particles on this side than there are this side. According to Boyle's law, if we increase the volume, we are decreasing the pressure. So what that means is that the side that has less particles won't have as many collisions. We have to reestablish that equilibrium so the reaction will push toward the reactant side so we can make more particles so that more collisions can happen to reestablish that pressure equilibrium. So then the opposite is true if we decrease the volume. In that sense, we are increasing the pressure and that means the side that has more particles is going to react so that there will be less particles, less collision, since pressure is being increased. We can make it a little easier by saying it this way. If we make the volume bigger, the side that has the bigger amount of particles wins. If we make the volume smaller, 
The side that has the smaller amount of particles wins. Okay? Now I should also tell you that if you have a system in which the moles of reactant is equal to the moles of product, then if you increase the volume of pressure, it doesn't matter. It will change things equally across the board. Lastly, as far as the catalyst goes, it speeds up both ways, so it doesn't favor either side. It speeds both the Ford reaction and the reverse reaction. So that's the end of our time for today. We learned about Le Chatelier's principle, how if you put a stress or a change on a system that's in equilibrium, that system is going to shift in such a way to relieve that stress. We talked about how temperature and volume, and pressure, the number of moles, catalysts, how those all affect a system at equilibrium. So I hope, as always, it's been informative to you. If I can answer any questions, please give me an email. I'd love to see you guys as soon as I can. Oh, they're back. Oh, holy cow. Ah, okay. Hey, take care of yourselves. God bless. Oh, no.